Hello everyone, uh, I'm Sebastian. Nice to be here again with you for this SIGGRAPH, uh, virtual SIGGRAPH. This is actually the personally my 20th uh, SIGGRAPH in a row and I only missed two this past two years. Um, I uh, dearly miss uh, the event, uh, but it's one of my favorite uh, shows and my favorite conferences in the world. I started in 2002 um, in San Antonio in Texas. That was my um, first big event when I started the algorithmic project. So I always uh, keep SIGGRAPH uh, uh, in some uh, very special place in my heart. So uh, welcome to this edition of uh, the Substance Talk uh, at uh, SIGGRAPH 2021. And uh, let's start, uh, let's start uh, digging into what we have to for you today. So first, uh, obviously, I want to talk about the big release that we did in June of uh, Adobe Substance 3D. It's great, uh, we're super, super happy to have uh, released this. Uh, it's, uh, the reception is great already. We're seeing a lot of uh, uh, good, uh, good things on that front, so we're very happy to see, to see that. Um, and as we kept saying, it's only the beginning of these new products, these new offerings, these new co this new content. And actually, I want to talk a little bit about this. In the next month, you will see a lot of uh, improvements in the tools and content and connectivity to other um, applications. For instance, in Substance uh, 3D Painter, uh, we've been working hard on uh, color management with the OCIO integration, and it's making good progress. So hopefully you, you will see that in, in the next uh, um, uh, very months. And that will be uh, very, very important for a lot of people, not only in the visual effects community, but also product uh, product design, obviously, and games more and more. Uh, this is interesting uh, that uh, this is coming. This is uh, this is coming in the next month. Also, we've been focusing on new uh, a new new uh, a warp tool, a 3D warp, that is uh, going to be really unique and very excited to uh, about this one. And uh, and then we can't wait to to show it to you. But that will that will uh, that will be uh, very interesting to see. And uh, also something that has been asked a lot, uh, which is the color, uh, the color picker, and the new color picker is coming into Substance uh, uh, 3D Painter. So that's um, that's um, we're very happy about this one. Also, um, I can talk about Modeler. Uh, Modeler uh, Close Beta right now is underway, and uh, we're working super hard. The, the team is really working like uh, crazy on this new tool and uh, working on the UX and the UI and the features and I've seen incredible stuff and um, you will be able to use uh, Muller uh, not only in VR uh, where it's coming from but also uh, on the desktop and the experience is is amazing and mind-blowing and really the team is hard at work on making this tool something that uh, I hope and I believe will become very significant in the, mo the world of sculpting and modeling in the in the future so uh, expect uh, expect more on that front and hopefully going for from closed beta to open beta uh, in the next months. Um, also, we've been releasing obviously something very long in the making, but that we're very, very happy about, which is the uh, Substance 3D add-on for Blender and also the Mixamo plugin for Blender that lets you directly from Blender access your materials and more uh, like it's, it's improving like the, the workflow that we've seen people uh, asking for and uh, hoping for and uh, now we're, we're very happy that we could we could release this um, and uh, we're seeing a lot of people actually downloading the, 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 the plugins already and making you good use of it so that's great that we can uh, help that community of uh, Blender and Substance users uh, together and uh, by, by providing this uh, these uh, plugins so that's that's great also, we're uh, very happy to announce that um, uh, we've been collaborating uh, with NVIDIA uh, for a, a Substance 3D plugin for Omniverse. And the plugin will be available uh, uh, soon and uh, it will enable a new um, material editing workflow for Omniverse uh, uh, and to interact directly with Substance materials inside of, uh, inside of the uh, Omniverse environment and, and ecosystem of products and services. So we, we believe this will unlock a lot of um, new um, uh, workflows and working uh, uh, opportunities like in, in, in Omniverse and that's, uh, that's very exciting. And um, that's uh, uh, also something that we've been working hard with uh, NVIDIA uh, in the past uh, past month and then we can uh, finally release so that's uh, that's great as well 
I would uh, also like today to announce that we're uh, partnering with uh, Random Man and uh, Pixar for a really, really, really cool art challenge and uh, featuring the iconic teapot that uh, you can see some, uh, a few teapots uh, back in, in my background. I have more, but I have one here. Uh, I've been a fan of uh, the, the teapot for, for, for years. And our very own uh, meat mat as well. You can see a few, meat, a few uh, mats uh, here. And um, so we want to relay this uh, and, and encourage people to participate. And we want to warmly thank the Random Man team and Dylan uh, Sisson especially for the partnership. It's always great to, to work with you, Dylan, and we're great to work with you, the Pixar team and the Random Man team. And so uh, it will be fun to see uh, our mascots uh, uh, side by side uh, in the in the community creation, so that's uh, that's great. I can I cannot wait to see what uh, you guys have um, uh, will be producing in this in this contest. Uh, other news uh, regarding Random Man. Actually, this is there is a, a a plugin being developed for Substance 3D Painter plus Lama, which is the new material lettering system in Random Man 24 just been released, and um, we're. Um, uh, that will be available on GitHub as a beta for, for users to play around with. Um, so expect uh, expect more news on that front as well. Um, and uh, talking about Pixar and Random Man, I'd like to <laughs> pass the mic to a Pixar veteran who joined uh, Adobe and uh, our team a few months ago as the new senior director of engineering at Adobe 3D Immersive. So I'm super happy to have Guido on board and uh, is now going to share with you some very, very cool updates about USD support, among other things. Thank you. Hi, I'm Guido Quaroni, Senior Director of Engineering for the 3D and Immersive Group at Adobe. Today, I'd like to give you a quick overview of some of the technology our team is working on. On June 23rd of this year, Adobe released a suite of applications and web services under a new Adobe Substance 3D offer. In this offer, we release a series of new features in the Substance Suite, but we also introduced new applications like Stager, targeted at virtual photography, and Modeler, an amazing tool for organic virtual sculpting. With this release, we also introduced two important rendering technologies. First is our unified rendering initiative called Adobe Mercury Rendering Engine. It comprises of several rendering technologies providing high quality, fast, and interactive editing of 3D scenes. Mercury can take advantage of the latest hardware architecture, leveraging both the CPU and the GPU, depending on the available resources. The second technology is the new Adobe Standard Material Definition, also referred as ASM. With ASM, we wanted to create a highly realistic, physically-based material designed to efficiently run in Mercury and to be the perfect companion for our substance materials, providing greater visual consistency across our applications. Let's talk about platforms. When we look at how we can empower artists using our tools, we see lots of opportunities in expanding beyond the traditional graphics workstation. Portable devices are becoming more and more powerful. On top of that, we believe in having our application being more connected with the cloud. This will require some software changes to be able to exchange complex 3D data beyond traditional files. We want to allow the user to share their work using web links accessible both by web and desktop application, regardless if the data is local or in the cloud. Beyond the fast and reliable access to remote data, we also want to provide an interactive experience while producing imagery of the highest quality. And to make things a bit more exciting, we want to make sure that all of this can be done while working either on highly powered workstation or on more portable devices like laptops and tablet. Among the many devices our artists can leverage, we also see the VR headset as an incredible tool for immersive three-dimensional workflow, especially when combined with a more traditional physical screen and mouse. This is how Modeler will operate, allowing a seamless transition between VR and desktop to provide the best from both worlds, given the right combination of amazing 3D feature without compromising productivity. Let's talk about interoperability and data interchange. So one of the biggest challenges when dealing with several dedicated applications targeted at specific workflows is the need of interoperability between these packages. You may be using one app to create in geometry, another one to define materials, and one more for directly paint on surfaces. 
While each application mainly rely on their own document format, they'll often offer additional support for other interchange file formats. Unfortunately, most of these formats, as they try to capture a common denominator across authoring application, they often miss features that can only be stored in the native document. Still, how awesome would be if we could use the same format as the document for each of our application while providing extension and customization only where needed. But first, as we explore this possibility of centralizing the document across the apps, we want to pick a comprehensive and extensible 3D scene definition for representing complex scene graphs. We're still in an exploratory phase, but UST is one of the most promising options out there. Adopting UST could mean, could mean many things. At the most superficial level, we can just add import and export of UST asset to all of our application. This will be already quite useful, and it will allow us to better interface with a number of commercial and open source packages that already support UST at many levels. But we could go even further. We could use UST at the core of our application, allowing even more functionality and scalability. Plus, it will give us a common API across our apps. Uh, we can even do copy and paste between the application, as long as they use, again, a common the representation, data representation. USD is quite an interesting technology and it has grown quite a bit in the last few years and we expect this growth to continue. I'd like to talk also about the viewport since it's a key component and as we focus on developing application targeting multiple surfaces, having a powerful and flexible viewport, viewport is key to this, to this effort. Despite having a unified rendering initiative, Mercury, each application still requires specialized code to interface with the renderer and it's quite complex to add additional renders if needed. We want to improve on this since some of our applications like Painter having the ability to preview the current project using different renderers while remaining in the same application in the same context could be quite valuable. And this is where Hydra could offer a solid and also an open source solution allowing our application to interface with renders in a more consistent way. We would support Mercury by just writing a Hydra backend rendering delegate, but also we could support automatically more renderers as long as those have a rendering delegate backend plugin available. As we look at ways to build great products for our artists, fundamentally we believe in 3D applications that support multiple surfaces, embrace open standards, and allow interoperability of 3D data and rendering engines. And now I'd like to introduce you Tammy Bubaker, Principal Research Scientist and Director of Research of the 3D and Immersive Group. I am Tammy Bubaker from Adobe Research. This summer at SIGGRAPH, Adobe is publishing a number of technical research papers in areas ranging from modeling to rendering to animation. Let's have a look, for instance, at our work on parametric modeling. Last June, we launched within the new Adobe Substance 3D Suite another kind of 3D models for ecosystem, parametric shapes. These 3D shapes are not static, but can dynamically evolve under user control, using a range of hyperparameters. They are typically created as a directed acyclic graph in Substance Designer and can be used immediately in Substance Stager. Users can simply drag and drop them in a scene and start exploring the space of possible shapes by manipulating the individual parameters, which can control either local details or entire structures on the asset. Now, what if one could edit such parametric shapes directly in a what you see is what you get or WYSIWYG fashion by simply clicking and dragging elements directly in the viewport? This is the challenge that our technical paper, entitled Dag Amendment for Inverse Control of Parametric Shapes, tackles. Basically, our algorithm modifies automatically the underlying graph representation of the shape, typically made of primitive generators and various kinds of modifiers. This modification takes the form of a graph rewriting, which amends special nodes to the graph. The resulting enriched graph can now be used to differentiate locally the shape with respect to these parameters. Our method is fairly generic and robust to dynamic changes in the geometry, the topology or the connectivity of the surface. 
One key element of our method is the ability to recognize a single point on the surface through all the possible parametric variations of the shape. We solve this issue by construction using our amendment process. Another important element is the notion of scale. Depending on the current scale selected by the user, we propose to alter the most relevant set of parameters to match the user intent. In practice, this scale is visually expressed as the size of the mouse pointer and allows to distinguish local from global editing steps. Here are a few examples running in our prototype. In this one, we can see that the scale has a major impact on which aspect of the shape is modified, with the placement of local elements on one side and the change of the overall aspect ratio of the shape on the other. Note that all the editing steps happen within the prescribed bounds of the hyperparameter which are defined by the creator of the parametric asset and ensure that all resulting shape instances are valid regarding their design intent. In this more complex example, we can see all the power of parametric modeling, with complex relationships between shape elements evolving in synchronicity. Still, our method allows to tailor the whole process intuitively, yielding numerous non-trivial variations in a couple of brush strokes. Our method remains entirely compatible with manual parameter setting, and the user can switch seamlessly from one mode to the other and vice versa, when specific numerical configurations have to be reached. Our method is also agnostic to the internal logic of the underlying graph nodes, and can already be used with a large number of them, including generators, booleans, deformers, and layout controllers. So essentially, this research project shows that local differentiation, combined with Jacobian filtering, offer a new foundation to build powerful interactive modeling tools, providing the user with the ability to control complex shape logic using a simple and intuitive metaphor. We believe we can develop this principle further in the future to fuel more and more stages of the procedural modeling workflow and for parametric design in general. There are many more Adobe research papers at SIGGRAPH this summer, so check the technical program. Here is a sample of those. This classic tablecloth trick demonstrates many of the outstanding challenges still to be addressed for simulating co-dimensional thin materials. To address these challenges, we propose co-dimensional incremental potential contact, or CIPC, a new model and method to simulate all co-dimensions with accurate frictional contact including cloth, hair, volumes, and even particles in a single unified model. This includes three core components. First, to address strain limiting, we develop a new constitutive strain limiting model, which for the first time provides exact strain limit enforcement fully coupled to elastodynamics and contact. This avoids both stretchy artifacts and membrane locking from artificially stiffened bending. Second, to capture finite thickness for co-dimensional objects, we designed an offset model that guarantees minimal separation. Even for very thin materials, this means that co-dimensional object interaction can be correctly simulated without artifact. Third, thin material collision detection requires highly accurate continuous collision detection, or CCD. We develop a new, easy to implement, additive CCD method that succeeds in the challenging cases where we currently find all existing CCD methods fail, while also achieving comparable and even faster performance on the easier cases where current methods can succeed. So let's take a look at how this works. Let's start with strain limiting. Simulating cloth with real-world material parameters creates locking with artificial stiffness and bending. Much softer membranes can be applied to get smooth flowing folds, but while the result is free from membrane locking like we see on the right, it stretches too much for most fabrics. To model real cloth materials like cotton, silk, and wool, modern simulators apply softer materials to avoid locking with a strain limiter to realistically capture cloth stretch behavior. But strain limiting is a challenging nonlinear inequality, and existing methods are unable to strictly enforce strain limits, as we see here on the left. 
This gives uncontrollable material behavior as we vary simulations. At the same time, they also aren't able to accurately couple strain limits with other forces, resulting in errors that produce unacceptable artifacts like the jittering we see here on the right. To tackle these challenges, CIPC applies a new constitutive strain limiting that for the first time gives a fully coupled strain limiting model with guarantees of exact limits. As we see here, this enables artifact-free simulation of cotton materials at large time steps. CIPC then maintains these guarantees even as we scale up to larger simulations. For example here, stepped at large frame rate size time steps, we simulate a cotton material with fine wrinkling without stretching or locking artifacts. Then, as we rotate the sphere, we also see how CIPC captures accurate frictional behavior, tightly winding the cloth inwards with tighter compression. CIPC preserves exact strain limits and ensures no intersections, even for challenging cases, for example here, as we rapidly pull a cloth across a bed of edge segments. When applied to garment simulations, CIPC can accurately model complex seaming and folding patterns directly. For example, here we keep a knife pleat created by tight folded layers of cloth stitched and creased throughout the simulation. Hi, my name is Paul Guerrero from Adobe Research. I'm going to give a short overview of our work in language generation for 3D shapes that we call ShapeMod. Parametric 3D shape representations, like the one Tami has presented before, are a great way to represent 3D shape families. However, creating a procedure or program that can represent a given shape family, such as these chairs, can be a challenging task. ShapeMod takes a step towards automatic shape program generation by automatically discovering useful higher level shape operations or macros in a collection of shape programs that can be reused throughout the collection. These discovered operations make programs more compact and expose a smaller number of meaningful parameters. One example of such an operation that was automatically discovered in a set of programs for 3D chairs is the macro four-leg base, which generates a wide variety of four-leg chair bases using only two parameters that control the chair leg size and positions. Having simpler programs with fewer meaningful parameters simplifies editing. We have created a simple editor for shape programs that is publicly available online, where parameters of shape programs can be edited interactively with immediate visual feedback. In this editor, we have created a challenge where the task is to modify parameters to replicate a given target shape as quickly as possible. In this case, the gray shape on top is the starting point and the yellow shape on the bottom is the target. Several users have completed this challenge and we measured their time and how close they got to the target, in addition to asking them a few questions about the experience. We found that using shape mode operations reduces the time users need to reach the target shape significantly, as shown in these graphs here. Using the more concise operations discovered by shape mode also benefits neural program generation, such as the generator we presented in last year's uh, SIGGRAPH Asia called Shape Assembly. Here we can see a result from visual program induction, where we generate a program that reconstructs a given shape. In this case, we have as input the point clouds and reconstruct the shapes you can see below. When comparing programs generated with and without discovered operations, we can see that results with discovered operations have more accurate reconstruction results with fewer errors. Smaller programs are easier to generate, and the reduced degrees of freedom regularize the problem reducing the number of bad reconstruction results. In summary, operations discovered by ShapeMod make shape programs more concise, interpretable and editable, which benefits artists and neural generators alike. We believe that this is a step towards automated methods to assist artists in the difficult task of creating shape programs for captured assets or from scratch. Hi, I'm Krishna Mulya from Adobe Research. I'm here to talk about our work on Monte Carlo denoising. The goal of this work is to denoise Monte Carlo renders at low sample counts at interactive frame rates. 
Current state-of-the-art methods that give the best quality at low sample counts are too expensive to be interactive, whereas the faster ones have limited denoising quality. Our work bridges this gap. In this example of denoising in 8 samples per pixel input, our method is over 10 times faster than the state-of-the-art kernel predicting method while producing a cleaner output. It runs at interactive frame rates at 1080p resolution. While denoising low sample count inputs, our method also produces higher quality than previous interactive methods, especially when reconstructing specular reflections. We owe these results to several design choices. First, we exploit as much information from the limited number of samples by processing each sample individually. Second, our method is temporally stable thanks to two techniques. Temporal accumulation of the noisy RGB image and embeddings and applying a temporal kernel on the previous output to make the current frame prediction as close as possible to the previous frames. As you can see in this example, processing each frame individually results in temporal flickering, but our method is temporally consistent. Third, and most importantly, we use an affinity metric between neural features to build our denoising kernels. Our network predicts feature vectors and kernel parameters per pixel which are used to compute the kernel entries. Predicting features and explicit pairwise interactions facilitate the learning problem, allowing us to use more compact neural networks. Finally, to benefit from a larger spatial context for denoising kernels, instead of using a single large kernel, we use a series of dilated kernels that are iteratively applied. We find that this is crucial to reconstruct low-frequency details such as the global illumination on the flat white wall in this example, where using a single kernel exhibits block-like artifacts. Despite using only a fraction of the network capacity utilized by the previous state-of-the-art kernel predicting methods, our method preserves even very thin geometric detail on denoising low sample count inputs. Our method also produces higher quality denoised results than the interactive methods while having a similar runtime cost. The difference is especially prominent for specular reflections where interactive denoisers often perform poorly. Sebastian here again. I hope you enjoyed all the, the cool demos and uh, presentations uh, from uh, Adobe Research. We hope you to see you again soon in real life. Uh, until then, uh, uh, take care and, um, and see you soon, hopefully. Thanks, bye.